Welcome to Talking Beats with Daniel Lalchuk. That's me, and I'm so glad you're here. If you like what we do, I'd love it if you gave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And if you're so compelled, write a review. That really helps. And maybe tell a friend or family member. They might like the show as much as you do. If you want to get involved in the program, visit our website, talkingbeats.com, and click Support the Show, where you can make either a one-time or a recurring donation. As we look to continue having cliche-free conversations of real substance with a diverse range of the world's most compelling people, your support is so appreciated, especially as we look to expand and increase our offerings. If you have a question, comment, or thought, find us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or if you wish to reach out directly, email me at daniel at talkingbeats.com. I'm so glad you're here. Let's get on with today's conversation. On today's program, physician Dr. James Weinstein. He served as chief executive and president of the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Health System and currently is the senior vice president from Microsoft Healthcare. One of the most distinguished surgeons in the country, he has received more than $70 million in federal funding and has published more than 300 peer-reviewed articles. One of his main goals is to get our healthcare system to a place of what he calls informed choice, where patients have more information that is evidence-based, safe, and effective so they can make the very best decisions about their health. He's the author of the book, Unraveled, Prescriptions to Repair a Broken Healthcare System. What are this expert's ideas to even the playing field, reduce wasteful spending, and give patients who need it the best shot at good care. What is Dr. Jim Weinstein's prescription? He's here to tell us. Welcome. My pleasure to be with you, Daniel. Thank you. You have a long history with healthcare. You have a long personal history with healthcare, not just as a doctor, but as a parent, as someone who's witnessed the highs and lows of the healthcare system in this country. I wonder when I look at your story and when I look through the moving book that you've written called Unraveled, Prescriptions to Repair a Broken Healthcare System, how do you think, this is a big question, how do you think your personal experiences, which are in some cases tragic with the loss of your young daughter, how how do you think that affects your wish to I don't know, streamline or obviously improve or, or better the system? What, what does that do to your trust in the system, to your ambitions for our system? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question, Daniel, because, um, I, as you know, I'm a physician. Uh, I was a practicing surgeon. Uh, and I actually treated a lot of people with cancer up their spine. And so when our daughter was diagnosed with cancer, that was uh, devastating uh, and remains devastating today. I, I think for the listeners who've lost a loved one, especially a child, that um, experience stays with you, unfortunately, forever. Um, the good news is it's um, great memories uh, the bad news is there's a lot of pain and suffering, especially for a child who went through treatment for her whole life, diagnosed at a very young age in chemotherapy, radiation treatment for almost every week of her life. So I think for me as a physician, um, it obviously leaves a scar. And, and as a surgeon, I often always leave a scar on my patients. Um, I hope that that scar creates a lot of good underneath that skin, whereas for me, what's underneath is painful. And it's not, uh, it doesn't heal the same way the tissues do uh, following a surgery. And it's clearly impacted all of my uh, career from being a physician to being a CEO to being a, a researcher and today to being a 
being a vice president at, at Microsoft, one of the largest companies in the world. It's affected all of those facets of my life. When you look at the hurdles people have to jump through, what do you think strikes you the most as as both someone who's who's experienced it and, and as someone who's who's sort of been working in the field his entire life and and now you're you're at, at a major corporation but you've you've been the head of a, a leading hospital Dartmouth Hitchcock uh, so you have different vantage points what kind of hurdles in our healthcare system assuming you have health insurance good health insurance assuming that it can still be a mess but you can answer it also in terms of what if you don't what do you what do you do what what are the hurdles that that still bother you so much that we haven't fixed that you've been trying to fix for years, decades? Yeah, I think there's probably three things. One is the lack of transparency, and we can talk about that as it relates to even COVID. Uh, Payment systems that um, still uh, are, are a problem for providing what people call value-based care, and I would say value to whom. And three is patient choice. I think patients, you know, we're seeing this with vaccinations. Um, You know, should I have surgery or not have surgery in my case? And we did large studies that in fact showed that not having surgery could be just as good as having surgery, which is you know, from a surgeon's standpoint, probably not the best thing to say, but true based on the data. And we have a lot of arguments about, you know, evidence-based medicine and let's go with the science. It's more than science. It's about people. And and um, various parts of our population do not have the support structure to manage even day-to-day care of their blood pressure, diabetes, or have a meal or a house to live in or, or a school to go to safely without being shot at. So, you know, I think we tend to put things in buckets that the person speaking understands and therefore can justify the path forward through their lens. But if we take a wider lens look, which I've been privileged to do, um, as you've alluded to, we're missing a lot of the people issues, the payment issues, the transparency issues. We know more about what's in a box of cereal than we do at our doctor's office. You talk about the fact that maybe for some patients not having surgery would be better. How is a patient supposed to decide or know? Obviously, the surgeon isn't going to say it's it's much better if I don't give you surgery, or maybe they would, but maybe you would. But would every surgeon be so honest? I think surgeons are honest, but I think, as I said, they see the world through the lens that they trained in. And so, you know, it's not... um, if I see something, I can fix it. But for some people, it is. But if you leave out the ability of, you know, the ability of the human body to heal itself, we're missing this whole um, immune system injury and repair phenomena that's remarkable. So in our studies, where we studied, you know, thousands of patients across the United States, a person with a very typical diagnosis of a disc herniation, a very common problem that often causes severe pain in the leg and can cause some weakness with a big picture of this disc in their MRI. You know, it's tempting to say there's a cause and effect and the treatment is surgery because I can take out that causative agent that's causing the effect of your pain and suffering. But they leave out the immune system's response to injury and repair that happens in almost everything. If we hit our uh, finger with a hammer, we cut ourselves, we get a common cold. We commonly, you know, do symptomatic treatment and we get better with tincture of time. 
It's the same thing with most back problems, including herniated disc. Over time, most cases get better. I'd say it's one to two percent of people, one to two percent, very low percentage of people that probably have to have surgery as a solution. I'd say the other 98 percent, if the patient understands and the doctor shares with them the decision process, which I call shared decision making, we started the first center in the country at Dartmouth, then patients with that choice with good information sometimes opt for non-operative care, watchful waiting, and can do just as well was the cover as the front story of the New York Times, our study, because it's such a common procedure and often with surgery, which has its own risk and benefits. So surgery is not always the solution, especially in elective cases. So in an emergency appendectomy or a strangled bowel or an infection, you know, that might be the only choice. But most surgery is preference sensitive, meaning patients who get good information should have a preference and their preference should drive the rates of intervention. You mentioned the word before, transparency, and also how it relates to COVID. What, what are you alluding to? What isn't transparent and what wasn't transparent during, what isn't, I guess, it's still going on, transparent during COVID that you think would have assisted our battle, the world's battle? Yeah, I think, you know, obviously I work for a tech company now. I think our digital infrastructure was not as robust by any means as we would like. And I don't just mean the United States, I mean the world, whether it's the World Health Organization or CDC or various uh, population health, uh, health agencies in cities just didn't have the information about the people they're trying to serve to understand um, how to manage this terrible problem. And, you know, you could say, well, you know, usually it's a terrible problem that causes some sort of solution to occur. But this, in this day and age, not to have data systems that talk to one another in the same language actually hurt us. Um, I did a paper with colleagues at uh, Microsoft and Dartmouth um, in March of 2020, we predicted the fatality uh, due to COVID based on patients' comorbidities, how many illnesses they have over 60, over 65. And we saw many communities, many zip codes at very high risk of fatality. We looked at fatality risk before this, you know, got out of hand based on the best data we had, because I felt that if we could look at national data, we could protect those most at risk. We didn't do that as a nation. You know, we had all the problems you're well aware of with the nursing homes, those at risk populations that somehow with the right supply chain issues, which also were a problem around PPE and everything else, we could have done a better job. And even today, I think we still don't have the kind of data sharing in at-risk communities to explain to people, just like the surgical decisions, here's the risk benefits. Let's weight your thought process in this decision and make the right decision for you. And instead, we've, we've taken you know, snippets of data often which proved to be wrong over time about the efficacy of drug treatments, uh, uh, about mask, no mask, about isolation, no isolation. Um, and we kind of move the ball um, down the field. And, and that's really hard for the public, for the average person to understand why are they changing this now? I thought we just quarantine and I thought we're going to flatten the curve and we're going to be okay. No, viruses don't work that way. And, and so I just feel like if we didn't know the answers, 
Uh, and, and there's a lot of reasons not to know the answers. We should admit that. That's the transparency. Here's where we are today. Hopefully by to tomorrow, we'll have a better answer. Because people are still afraid. And it's a, impacted the whole world economy in ways that are going to be very hard to change. I worry about the students and education in our country who've been kept out of school, maybe for smart people like yourself and others, it's, it wouldn't be a problem. But for half the country, missing a year of school is is disastrous. How long until we know how disastrous that is? Because we look at hospitalizations and we look at the deaths and, and we look at, at those numbers, but this is sort of a, a long-term issue. If it's disastrous, then it's going to render itself disastrous for that third grader in Baltimore who missed a year of school. It's going to render itself disastrous for years to come, right? Yeah. Well, Baltimore is a good example, or any big city, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago. It wasn't COVID that caused the educational problems. They were there before COVID. COVID exacerbated those problems. You know, the public health uh, issues for the country in 1974, uh, the public health authority thought that cardiovascular disease was really important because lots of people were dying from heart attacks. Oh, by the way, still hundreds of thousands of people die during COVID. You know, you wonder what happened to those people. They decided to study heart disease in a study called Framingham from Framingham, Massachusetts, they picked a community and they said, let's follow these patients for 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 years and look at the efficacy of some treatments. And that study still goes on today, 70 years later. And generations of families have been impacted by, you know, changing diets for cardiovascular disease that we're now well aware of, different medications. I think if we're really going to affect education and changing the infrastructure of this country, which isn't just highways and, 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 you know, 5G and, and uh, internet connections, but we need to fix the educational inner city problems. And we can't do it one administration at a time. It's a 20 to seven year commitment. Just like global warming has become kind of uh, uh, everybody wants to fix it now. It, you know, I think Bill Gates, uh, you know, said it. If we started today, it'd take 30 years, um, and we did everything. Fixing education and healthcare is a 30 to 50 year problem too. But we seem to always have this urgency as a democracy sometimes, which is wonderful. And we throw trillions, now trillions of dollars of things, used to be billions, and expect that those trillions are going to be magic. It's not, it's not the money. It's the process by which we want to train students like yourself. I was fortunate, our children were fortunate to have a real education. But they also had meals they could count on every day. They had a place to sleep every night. They came from a solid family. Um, and those things are not healthcare necessarily, but they're the biggest part of things affecting healthcare. Do you mean that a child is less likely to develop an illness or develop diabetes or something, or, or sort of medical problems stemming from having a, a bad childhood? Is, is is that one of the main things you're talking about, or are there other things? No, that's right. There's something called metabolic syndrome which often affects inner, inner city uh, children and they get early onset diabetes because of stress. They live in a very stressful environment. They don't have the appropriate food. Now here they are, you know, five, six, seven years old and their lifetime of health care is now predetermined by their zip code, not by anything else. Where you're born and where you live as a child often determines your life, unfortunately, in this country. At Dartmouth-Hitchcock, where you were CEO, you developed the Center for Shared Decision-Making, which is now used all over the world. What, what is this? This is, about patient, this is about patient choice. 
and uh, and I, I guess the goal is obviously to improve care and lower costs. What what, what was this all about? This shared decision making. It goes back to should I have back surgery or not have back surgery if I'm a female or even a male with um, breast cancer? Do I have surgery or do I not have surgery? If I'm a male with prostate disease, do I have surgery or not have surgery? And in many cases, surgical and non-surgical treatments can give similar results but there's actually greater risk with surgery if you take prostate disease. Some sort, some kinds of prostate uh, problems can have watchful waiting, is what I would call it, where you don't have to do anything. And over time, tincture of time heals a lot of things. You'll get better. And if you have surgery, you also get better, but you risk the surgical complications of impotence. So if you allow the patient to understand that risk-benefit, they have a better informed choice to decide what's right for them. And that's what shared decision-making was. Women with breast cancer should have a lumpectomy or mastectomy. If the results are the same, a lot of women want to preserve the breast. Some women, because of cancer, please take it away. I don't want any chance of cancer. But that's an individual's decision given good information about the outcomes. And that's what shared decision making is. And in some states, they adopted this as law, like in California. You can't do a mastectomy without shared decision making. So I think it's one of the solutions to variation in clinical practice around the world. There's always going to be some coefficient of variation, some noise in the system, this treatment versus that treatment. But you can kind of narrow that coefficient if you allow patients the best evidence and treatment decisions and provide that information in ways that they can understand and make an informed choice. What does that mean exactly, ways they can understand? Does, Does that mean emailing someone a list of bullet points or a list of statistics because a lot of people are probably so busy or 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 trying to get through the everyday life or, or balancing kids and a cancer diagnosis and and 10 other things that they they barely would have the the energy or the wherewithal to to read exactly or understand exactly what the situation really is yeah I think that's a fair point. I think what we did is we used um, um, language that was acceptable for seventh and eighth graders. We used pictures of stick figures. So um, if three in a hundred risk of infection, you'd see three stick figures lit up out of a a set of a hundred stick figures. So you made the data understandable for the patient who's making that decision. You know, what's my risk of being better? If we said it was 70%, we could say, let's light up seven out of 10 figures. Oh, I see. I could be one of those seven, or I could be one of those three. So that's a choice I can make, right? And so providing that information in a conversation where the patient understands the information and can make an informed choice, I think is the key. And of course, if you have cancer, even for our own daughter, you forget everything else anybody's talking to you about once somebody tells you you have cancer. So you need to take the time. Most of these decisions don't need to happen immediately, almost rarely. They need thoughtful discussion with your friends, family, and then you make a choice. And, and doctors, you know, want to do that. But they're pushed by the current billing systems and their workplace of work to actually produce more, get more patients through, get things done. We've got a long waiting list. That doesn't provide that kind of time. So we set up a laboratory at Dartmouth Cox so patients I could give them a prescription, go to the shared decision-making center, take your time, review this material, get your questions answered, then come back and we'll decide about 
which treatment you want to consider. What did you get out of writing in your book your deeply personal story with your daughter? Because you mentioned that treatments began at an early age and went regularly for her in, entire life. And it, it's not so simple, the path that you took versus the path that some of the doctors who were treating her wanted you to take. And at certain points, you felt deeply pressured to accept various treatments for your daughter that, that you weren't sure were worth doing. What was happening? Well, I think because I um, kept every article written about her disease, which was a acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And I read, because I could read all the information, um, and because I, my wife and I understood her needs and desires as best we could, you know, as an infant and then as a young child, those decisions... Um, you know, I wanted scientific information to support them, and some of my physician colleagues couldn't do that for me. And, and yet they were willing to experiment on a young child, which, you know, at some point, maybe that's your only option. But as, you're, as it's your child, um, and these are lethal treatments, that affected her day-to-day -day life, it, it, it became quite difficult. And some of the treatments that were being offered were not as effective as they said they were. And I became, you know, unhappy, irritated that you would actually have me fly, because I looked all around the country because I could, you would actually have me fly to try an experimental treatment on our daughter that in fact, what you told me is not true. And so that, 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 that caused me to even value shared decision-making more, that every patient I saw or every patient colleague see should be as if it was their own family member. These are critical decisions that affect somebody for their whole lifetime. And, you know, I took that seriously, and one of the reasons I joined Microsoft wasn't because I thought Microsoft was the best company in the world. It's because I thought maybe I could have a more global impact on this thought process that we're talking about, using technology to better inform consumers, patients, their families about treatment options with good data to make decisions and, you know, COVID and all the different treatments, you know, I, I, I hope we learn a lot from this and I hope we capture information that I don't think we're capturing quite frankly, uh, in a way that, you know, bringing things to, to the public for treatment are incredibly important risk and benefits. And, you know, I, you've probably been vaccinated. I've been triple vaccinated. <laughs> um, uh, uh, nobody's following me. Nobody's asking me any questions. Yet here's a chance for our country to learn so much from so many people being treated by actually new therapies, which are miracles, these mRNA vaccines, remarkable. But where's the data systems to be putting all this together to actually inform the public the next time this happens? And so I'm a little disappointed, uh, Daniel, um, that we the money we've spent, the government spent, and private sector spent, we should have been doing, doing a lot more here. And um, I hope it doesn't hurt us. Over time. What, what data system specifically do you mean to prepare us for the next one? What should the public be told? What 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 does a data system even mean in terms of everyday resonance? If I was in charge of the world, um, which I'm not, fortunately, <laughs> probably, <laughs> um, I would have all the data public on a public website. So if I'm company X and I've given, you know, 50 million shots, which is not uncommon today with these vaccines, 
where's the data on those 50 million shots and what's happening to those people from before they got the shot till today and keep that data system updated so that next time this happens, we can actually all know, you know, what's happened. We hear bits and bytes from the news media. Um, I, I don't know what's true anymore sometimes, unfortunately. And I just, as a scientist, and we talk about let's treat the science, where's the data? So I'm, I'm capable of understanding. You're capable of understanding how many women, how many men, how many shots, which arm, did it cause their diabetes to get worse or better? Did it affect their time off of work? What kind of reactions happened? You know, we hear a little bit about the cardiac reactions in young men, but what does that mean? And, and so my son now is eligible for vaccination. What's the risk to him? Do I really understand that? I have to make a decision. And I just think if, if we're more transparent as a society, what's the complications of back surgery? I've published all that. Anybody could look it up. It's on the web. It's at NIH. You should be able to decide with that data. And we even made calculators so you could put your own information in, your own symptoms, and it would predict what your likely outcome would be eight years from the time you decided. I mean, we have the ability to do that today, but we're not doing it. And we're spending trillions of dollars. Well, are we spending money on things that we shouldn't be spending money on? Or is it we need more money? I mean, what's the... I, th I think it's I think it's a we're spending we're fifty per thirty to fifty percent of money in healthcare today is waste. So we don't need more money. We we need the right treatments. Well, what let's, is let's, let's well, what does waste mean? But but before you go on, let me just interrupt to ask: what, what exactly does waste mean? Let's say thirty to fifty percent is waste. Those are staggering numbers. What what's a concrete example of a, a wasteful expenditure when it comes to healthcare dollars? Well, just think of our administrative cost in the U.S. being 30% more than Europe. Just think of, take back surgery. I'm a spine surgeon. I, I, I told you that only 2% of patients, I think, are probably surgical candidates. Yet some people would operate at 50%. Each of those operations, let's say, cost fifteen to $30,000 minimum. There's hundreds of thousands of those. But let's say that we're using a very expensive drug when an inexpensive drug would do the same thing. Um, the public has no knowledge of that. In, in Europe, um, they did have public transparency of outcomes of data, and that's how the NHS in England makes treatment decisions on what's available for the consumer. There's no reason we couldn't do that in the United States. So, to me, waste is a big deal because what that means is, and, and don't forget, Medicare for the United States is for the whole country. So where you and I are from, New Hampshire, isn't a big spender. But if you're in California or, or Florida, they spend a lot more on health care per, per capita than the United States. So it isn't distributed equally across the country. Those that utilize more, there's only one pot of money, they're taking more proportionally than other states. So what are the diseases like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, we really need to fix? Those aren't elective procedures. Those are things where real best evidence should get best treatment to all patients, regardless of means. Then I'd start to look at elective things like back surgery and hip surgery and knee surgery and, you know, other, other kinds, you know, plastic surgery. Those are luxuries. And, and yes, it's wonderful to have them, but let's make sure that we take care of those most in need with the dollars we have. If there's even 10% waste on, on a $4 trillion budget, that's real money. <laughs> so, I'm saying there's 30, 50 percent waste. The National Academy of Science, which has also studied this, uh, uh, of which I've been part of, they've also come up with 30 to 50 percent waste. 
So, so it isn't that we need to throw more money into healthcare. We need to do healthcare differently. End of life, we spend 80% of dollars in the healthcare system at the end of life. Most people at the end of their life don't want to die in a hospital. But if you live in certain cities in California, you're going to die in the hospital and you're going to see 21 doctors. If you live in New Hampshire, Dartmouth-Hitchcock, you likely won't die in the hospital and you'll see three doctors. Those cost differentials are hundreds of thousands of dollars per person. For no better outcome, everybody that I just talked about died. They died differently at a different expense. What does Microsoft have to do with healthcare? You spent your life at leading hospitals, and as, as we said recently, uh, as the, the head of Dartmouth-Hitchcock, one of the biggest hospitals in, in New England, one of the best in the entire country. Uh, and then you were, uh, I think, re- retired from from or at least partially retired, and and then then you got a call. Of Microsoft. We don't think of Microsoft and healthcare as necessarily going together, but indeed there you are as a senior vice president, leading strategy and and innovation. What what is this? Well, it's as strange to you as it was to me, maybe. But um, I was teaching at Northwestern actually in Chicago, and I got a call from a colleague now at Microsoft and said what are you doing? And, and you know, I told him about teaching, and he said, you should come and help us lead healthcare for Microsoft. I, I said, what does that mean? <laughs> well, you should tell us what we can do in healthcare. You know, technology has been involved in healthcare on and off Google, Amazon, most recently uh, with the Haven. Um, and, and they've decided now again to get out of healthcare. Uh, Google's been in healthcare on and off. Microsoft had its fits and starts in healthcare. I think what I'm trying to bring to Microsoft and the opportunity with Sachin Nadala, who's an incredible leader who I really think understands um, what people need. I figured if I could impact technology for the world about healthcare, Um, it would be extremely meaningful. And we've done, in the three years plus I've been there now, we've created a healthcare cloud. Um, We've created partnerships with most of the health systems in the world. Um, And those partnerships are like shared decision-making. Microsoft doesn't know healthcare like Dartmouth-Hitchcock does. But Microsoft has tools that can make Dartmouth-Hitchcock better. We have great partners around the world um, that were able to help with technology. And, and when you take something like COVID, had those tools been in place, the data we were t- uh, talking about would have been much more available and sh- much more easily shared and maybe would have saved some lives. You are studying various things at Microsoft. One of them is various discrepancies in algorithmic calculations regarding healthcare, racial, ethnic disparities that that might be very surprising to people. And I want to talk about those and also how surprised you were when you found out that maybe someone with dark skin gets evaluated differently by a computer than someone with light skin. I would say it this way, Daniel. I I was surprised, uh, but not totally. So even in the studies I did or what we've been talking about, collecting data, you know, age, gender, uh, uh, other health issues, um, those turn when when you're doing uh, analytic analysis and trying to do predictive models or trying to assess, you know, who's at risk for COVID on, and what's your risk because you're 80 versus you know, 45, and you live in Baltimore versus Hanover, New Hampshire. Those are all variables that affect risk. What I was surprised by, and and I think I've shared some with you, that some of the risks based on the color of your skin actually um, probably was detrimental uh, in actually assuming risk for patients for kidney transplantation or heart surgery because they gave you different points based on your skin color. 
And so to me, that's structural bias that we've actually created in the health system for certain races by those algorithms that are generally made by medical societies. And I've written about this myself as well. So, so today, artificial intelligence, you know, is talked about a lot, whether people understand what that is or not is another question. But artificial intelligence is extremely powerful, but it's only as powerful as the information you feed into the system. And if you misfeed information and and affect and, and, and create extra points because you're black or Hispanic or brown or yellow or Jewish or Catholic, whatever, you could be and often are misrepresenting what that person's treatment effect and or best treatment might be. And so when I have seen this, I've said, this is an opportunity to actually bring data analytics to large data systems to fix those imperfections. You've articulated the, the situation well, but, but could you give a specific example of where, if I go for certain evaluations, computer-based evaluations or assessments, and someone whose skin tone is much darker than mine goes, and we have similar conditions, uh, and everything is the same but skin color, what would it look like? Uh, you mentioned kidney transplants, and what kind of test would this be? Would computer evaluation consist of? Let me give you a e fairly straightforward example I think the listeners can relate to. So there's a lots of skin cancers, right? So melanoma is a skin cancer. So let's say you built a predictive model for melanoma where the the camera reads the skin lesion and says, that's a melanoma versus a mole versus, you know, a birthmark. But if the, the models only trained on white people, so how can I possibly use that model to predict what that lesion is in a dark skull, dark skin colored person? So models are only as good as what you build them with. So you need representative samples of all races. And maybe you need even subpopulation algorithms or AI models that learn based on certain skin color, certain age. Because I actually don't think skin color is as big a risk factor as some people think it is. I think your genetics, independent of your skin color, is probably much more predictive. But in kidney disease, the example we're talking about, people look at how your kidneys function called glomerular filtration rates. So how well your kidneys filter things. I'll try to say that four times fast. Yeah, <laughs> but that's why I didn't use that example. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but just because you're uh, African American, your cardiac risk is higher. That's not necessarily true. But you know, even in COVID, we got into these issues of race. I mean, tremendous issues into race. But I don't think it was just your skin color by any means. It was where you lived, what kind of housing you had, how many people you were in close proximity with. Um, you know, Hispanics were probably even more at risk, not because they're Hispanic even, but they lived in close uh, quarters. They were uh, crop uh, uh, um, gatherers and, you know, they had to go to work every day and they were together all the time and they couldn't get away. They didn't have, they could only use public transportation. There's lots of reasons people were at risk. The nursing homes wasn't because of color. It was because they were all stuck together with high comorbidities and very at risk populations. So again, we have to be careful because race has become such a hot topic in, in the world. Um, and I think to a negative extent, because, you know, uh, you know, whether it's Martin Luther King, you know, the content of your, of your character or whatever, I, I think in healthcare, color is, is not something I'm thinking about ever. 
and and uh, I'm thinking about you know genetics, um, your immune system, where you're born. As I told you, is one of the biggest predictors. Um, your your education level, your income level, whether you have a spouse and you're happy, or you're married, divorced, whether you drink a lot, all these things are so important in, in actually predicting outcomes. And race to me is is not one of them. I mean, I'm sure it's a, a role, but that's where these big data sets that I wish we'd be capturing should really answer those questions very clearly. But I'm going to argue and go out on a limb here and say that it isn't the race issue. It's the housing issues, the food issues, the comorbidity issues, the income issues, the education issues, the transportation issues, on and on and on. That's the predictor of bad outcomes. You know as well as I do that on this program we always talk some about music and and uh, and. You certainly have a great relationship with music. You're a lifelong music lover. Indeed, your uh, other daughter uh, was a, a cellist uh, growing up. I was close w- with and grew up and played a lot of music together. And so music's been in your life for a long time. And I wonder what you're listening to now and, and what music does. And also, you know, we hear about music having a, a therapeutic effect and and even a, a medically positive effect effect. Is that all a myth or is there something to that as well? I'm I'm a big believer in the relationship between music and wellness. And I think it starts from in in utero. And um, I think, as you said, our daughter Chelsea's a cellist and she would do concerts every year for her sister to raise money for children with uh, disabilities. And um, she started a scholarship fund at the College of Engineering at, at Dartmouth called Thayer. But at the end of her concert, she would always play Song of the Birds from Pablo Casal. And, you know, this sort of succession of rainbows that Casal has talked about, you know, it, it just, I wanted, and she wanted people to just be hopeful. That, that there is another rainbow. Or, or you know, as, uh, myself as a Jewish person, Kol Nidre at Yom Kippur, um, that really you go through three times to, to try to get rid of all your transgressions. And I thought it was so poignant and, and beautiful and, and yet haunting to, to listen to that Max Brook um, piece. And, and a funny story, we, we were in Cambridge, England, and I was there for Microsoft, and um, uh, we were visiting Windsor Castle, and I, I heard this music that just kind of was like, wow, it was the Echolog for Strings by Finzi, and um, it was so profoundly spiritual for my, my wife Mimi and myself. We, we went into the castle and just listened to the, to the music. And then I think today, Daniel, um, people just, music is, you, you're, you're the expert. But to me, it, it brings everybody together. Um, I don't care what race you are, what language you speak. Um, if you can read a piece of music and you can play an instrument, you can be part of a great group, an orchestra. And it really levels the playing field for people. I mean, I, I just think it's 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 the kind of thing we should think about as a as a society, as a nation, that bringing young people together with a sheet of music and playing the same song, independent of your beliefs and thoughts, is such a beautiful thing. And and I recently wrote a piece. And I quoted Charlie Puth because of his piece with James, Ch- James Taylor, Why Can't We Just Get Along? And I, I wish I could play it for Congress or something, but um, it's just true. You know, we're all sisters and brothers, as he says. And I, I just think we've just gotten lost. And I think music is the kind of thing that people like you can bring people together and appreciate life independent 
of of all what's going on. And uh, as a cellist, I'll just mention, you know, one other James Taylor piece, Benjamin, uh, where Yo-Yo Ma and Mark O'Connor come together too to to play a beautiful piece. And you can bring people with different skills. I mean, I think of James Taylor, not the guitarist and a, and a, and a singer and a, a writer, but boy, that guy can whistle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go. I'm going to go listen now. Uh, Jim Weinstein, I wonder uh, what you're occupied with right now. It's it's a daunting task that you have, it sounds like, and you have a big job. In addition to that, you teach at Harvard Business School. You teach at the Kellogg School at uh, Northwestern. You teach at many uh, institutions still at Dartmouth, also the corporate job at Microsoft. What are you working on day to day that has you really curious and passionate? I think it's the equity issues for the world, just as we were alluding to, and one of the reasons that I like the Charlie Puth song, Why Can't We Just Get Along? I, I'm going to Morehouse College uh, on Wednesday, uh, Mimi and I, are, and I'm going to talk about health equity at Morehouse, one of the best uh, African-American colleges in, in this country. And I'm, I'm excited to do that because I think as a Microsoft person, we can actually help share some data that can help build generations to come and get rid of the inequities we see in this world. And so that's my mission right now, and I'm excited to be part of it. Dr. Jim Weinstein, for a extremely candid and revealing, complex conversation, big issues for us to think about and ponder, uh, I hope there's another time, and I indeed thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Congratulations for all you're doing. Thank you. You've been listening to Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk. The original theme music is by Ronald Barkham. The content coordinator is Nathaniel Mose, and Doug Christian is executive producer. We invite you to subscribe and leave a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. You can support us at patreon.com slash talking beats. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash talking beats. And be sure to check us out on social media. We'll see you next time on Talking Beats with Daniel Elchuk.